Okay, I think we can get started. So hello everyone and welcome to the latest installment of uh, the NYU Climate Degradation Accelerators webinar series, where as uh, many of you know, we cover topical issues in the climate mitigation field. My name is Cesar Rodriguez Garavito, and I'm the director of the Earth Rights Advocacy Program and the Center for Human Rights and World Justice, where CLX, the Climate Litigation Accelerator, sits. On March 29, 2023, the UN General Assembly adopted by consensus a landmark resolution that requested an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on states' legal obligations on climate change. Really the key achieved, this, this is a fundamental achievement that was the result of a years long campaign by Pacific Island activists and other youth activists, as well as the dedicated diplomatic efforts of Pacific Island states and allied nations. But now that that's been achieved, the question is, where do the efforts surrounding the ICJ advisory opinion go from here? To discuss this, as well as the potential ramifications of the advisory opinion, we're grateful to be joined by Vanuatu legal advisor, Kevin Chand. Kevin is an international environmental lawyer from Fiji and based in New York, where he currently serves as the legal advisor to the permanent vision of Vanuatu, mission of Vanuatu to the United Nations. Kevin has also worked on consulting projects with the High Seas Alliance and regional Pacific organizations and taught international environmental law, ocean policy, and design at Stanford. He was also an Ocean Design Fellow at the Stanford Center for Ocean Solutions at the D School, which I'm particularly uh, interested in because we've drawn uh, quite a bit on the work of the D School in, in doing workshops with uh, climate activists and scholars from around the world uh, at CLX. Prior to moving to the US, Kevin worked as an environmental lawyer in Fiji, where his focus was on coastal fisheries, customary marine tenure systems, and climate red plus projects. So before we get started, just a, uh, just a logistical note, uh, as those of you who have attended past webinars that CLX has put together, we have two segments to the event. The first one, the one that we're in, is the public aspect, the public, the, the public facing uh, segment of the event where uh, everyone is invited to attend who registered. Uh, and where we'll have a, a quite a bit of time for Q&A, uh, by the way, because we switched uh, this year to a more interactive um, uh, format where we choose to have one uh, interviewee, one panelist, as opposed to many panelists, um, so that there's ample time for uh, the audience to ask questions. And really the second half is meant to be more of a, of a dialogue as opposed to a Q&A conventional session. So I, uh, I will try to limit our uh, the first part of the public session to 30 to 40 minutes uh, maximum. And then there's a second segment uh, that's by invite only for the community of practice uh, to discuss uh, strategic, strategic issues uh, with those of you who registered and will be joining uh, through the separate link that uh, was circulated. That will be a half an hour session uh, after the public one. So without further ado, Let's get started. First of all, uh, Kevin, Kevin, thanks again for making time to be with us today. So let's start with the basics. Um, can you provide a, a brief background to the ICG advisory opinion, including the legal and political strategy behind it? Uh, hi, Cesar. Thank you for having me. It's a real honor to be here today. Uh, we're at a very exciting time in the campaign. Uh, the ICJ just issued press release yesterday indicating that they have received the resolution from the UN Secretary General. So we were very excited. This sort of kicks off uh, the next phase officially. But having said that, now that this is officially a pending case, I am limited in what I can say. I can say a lot, <laughs> but I can't talk to the specifics on uh, the legal themes we'll be touching because that has to be coordinated um, with other member states uh, as well as within our own government. So today I'm speaking you know, in my personal capacity. Um, but to answer your question, which is a very broad one for me, because I've been covering this for a while and we've gone through a lot of processes, maybe it's useful to start at the very beginning, uh, part of the beginning. Uh, in 2011, Palau was one of the first countries to first begin to consider taking climate change to the International Court of Justice. 
uh, this uh, this initiative is something that didn't quite go through, but it's something that Vanuatu, our legal team, um, our diplomatic teams have all learned from, and I think it's informed a lot of our interactions going forward and how the legal and political strategy was built. Um, and then maybe you know pushing forward a little, uh, 2019. Uh, this is this story I think uh, many of you might know. There was a law school colloquium in the University of the South Pacific, uh, which is based in Vanuatu. And I'm an alum of that school as well. Uh, very pleased to see that they've made big waves. And we, a group of law students within that uh, law campus, approached the Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time, Minister Ralph Reagan Vanu, uh, with this idea to, you know, we've, after every COP process, there's a lot of disillusionment, disappointment with how the world is addressing this climate crisis we're in. Uh, the Pacific always comes away from this very, you know, unimpressed with the results that are put forward. So one of the tools that uh, this class had explored was, you know, taking uh, climate change to one of the international fora, like the ICJ, it lost, et cetera. So the government, uh, the minister, Ralph Reganvanu was, he's a very charismatic man, a very bright human rights lawyer, someone who cares about these issues very deeply. He brought this to the government. The government, you know, saw this as an opportunity to make a difference. And uh, from then on, uh, this officially kicked off the process where Vanuatu began engaging in building a legal strategy, drafting the resolution before bringing it to New York um, in late 2020. Sorry, late 2021. Um, and then in New York, you know, these processes evolve quite a bit. The Pacific uh, is the natural base for Vanuatu's, you know, work in the Pacific because in New York at the UN, we negotiated as a block of countries called the Pacific Small Island Developing State. So we first brought the resolution with the legal questions that would go to the ICJ to this group. Uh, this then evolved um, the resolution a bit further. The Pacific had a lot of buy-in into this. Uh, and then the next stage was um, uh, developing a core group uh, that was more representative of the UN body. You know, we had countries from all different regions, 18 countries in total from the global north, south, you know, high emitting countries, low emitting countries. And within this group, we uh, worked, we worked the resolution to make it palatable for the General Assembly. Uh, and I think there was a lot of good work put into this process because ultimately what we were anticipating to be, uh, you know, a tight vote uh, eventually led to consensus. And I think it was a lot of the efforts of, uh, well, Vanuatu, but also the core group in advocating within the UN to all member states. Uh, I might have given you a bit more than you asked for, but uh, that's, you know, a broad overview of uh, the story. I'm happy to delve in deeper in different parts of the timeline. That was very helpful, uh, Kevin. Uh, why don't we go deeper into the result in the consensus resolution? Uh, it's not easy to get consensus on issues like the ones that you put forward the the put before the um, the UN General Assembly, but now looking forward to what comes next, what uh, implications does uh, uh, consensus have in terms of how confident you feel about the uh, the, the next stage? And in general, uh, could you comment on the process and then the outcome um, of a consensus at the UN General Assembly? Uh, yes. Um, uh, like I said, consensus was something we had never anticipated. We always thought this was going to be a very contentious issue brought before the GA. With the Palau initiative, there was um, there was a group of ambassadors that were working on the resolution, and it was quite pointed. You know, it was targeting uh, the actions of states within their jurisdiction and the transboundary harm of the emissions they were putting out, you know, resulting in the climate um, crisis. And I think that was more targeted in a way, but uh, it never got off the ground there. Uh, there was quite a strong political push uh, on Palau uh, bilaterally that resulted in that, that initiative not quite succeeding. And we learned from that process. So coming to New York this time around, what we needed to do was build a strong enough, you know, Vanuatu is a small country, we don't have a lot of political power at the UN. Um, so what we needed was having a strong base and the Pacific Small Island Developing States, the, the core group were the necessary buttress to resist 
any type of political pressure that would come our way from the large, you know, powerful countries in the world that had previously prevented the, you know, the previous initiative from going forward. So I think achieving consensus uh, in this new iteration, while, you know, we personally didn't see it as something tenable, the core group of countries that, you know, worked with us, you know, saw this as a pos possible way to take this forward. The UN now, as you know, some of you might be aware, is hugely divisive. You know, the war in uh, in Europe is causing quite a bit of tension. There's a huge divide between the West, uh, different parts of the world. You know, Russia at play, and uh, there was not a lot of optimism. And the core group highlighted this initiative as being one of those, you know those rays of hope, you know, and light within the UN, something that we could all, you know, work with a common purpose towards. So I think within the core group, we, you know, like have made quite a lot of efforts to reach out to the large powerful countries, you know, the developing South, uh, global North, high emitting countries advocating our case and the value of, you know, taking something like this forward. At the end of the day, you know, we're all, we all have the same goal. This advisory opinion is, Unlike many other advisory opinions before it, the nuclear case, um, you know, the Chagos advisory opinion, there's a lot of consensus around addressing climate change. You know, we have Paris Agreement, you know, C, the COP processes, even in the UN General Assembly, there are a lot of processes underway, but there's a huge gap between, um, you know, what the IPCC is saying we need to be doing and what we're actually doing under our NDCs of the Paris Agreement. And I think that resonated with a lot of states. They saw this as one of the tools that could, you know, be innovative and move the needle uh, in terms of how we're addressing um, climate action, climate justice. So I think eventually this sort of, it was hard to stand in the way of this initiative moving forward. There was so much momentum behind it within the core group itself and our allies and our friends uh, that to the last moment, you know, you know, being one of the technical leads here in New York, we were always worried that someone would call for a vote, um, as happened with the right to a healthy environment, which I know you've covered in past, um, in a past webinar. And, um, but I know they, they, they were expecting that, but for us, you know, anything can happen at the UN. <laughs> so we were bracing <laughs> ourselves for a last minute call for the vote. We were pleased it uh, wasn't done, but to answer your question, um, I think consensus is a powerful signal to the court. We had 132 co-sponsors. This is a demonstration of a strong will, you know, that the globe has with this initiative. And I think the court will look at this, you know, and they will consider uh, that no one objected to us bringing this request before them. And I think it will embolden them to be more robust in what they put forward. I, I think one of the big concerns um, with any advisory opinion is, you know, asking a question and getting a bad answer or getting an adverse uh, opinion. We've done everything in our power to prevent that from happening in terms of crafting the question to, you know, you know like uh, mm -hmm. move forward in the direction as opposed to moving backwards. Uh, but, and I think this signal with consensus is one of those pushes that will direct the court in a, in a positive way. Uh, but also, um, we're expecting a large number of states to make submissions. But maybe I'll stop there. That's for the, the next part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why, why don't we look into the questions themselves? Uh, because, uh, of course, the rest of the conversation will focus on what comes next, as we had um, uh, planned. But uh, just for the sake of clarity here and also to get your view on the questions themselves. Um, so what was the rationale behind the final resolution text Text, and, and what's uh, the UNGA resolution asking the court uh, uh, about? Sure, so maybe starting at the beginning of the process in um, late 2021, when we came to New York, well, when we began our advocacy in New York, we had a draft resolution crafted by Vanuatu and our legal team. Uh, and this resolution was markedly different. You know, it had a very climate justice lens, you know, which we still maintain in the resolution, but it had a different look and a different feel. Uh, one of the values of working within the General Assembly and, you know, the informal consultations we hosted in New York with all the legal advisors and all the missions 
was trying to find common ground, trying to find uh, as much support as we could. And the questions did evolve a little. Um, there was more succinctness in terms of the preamble language. Um, one of the key objections from the Global North was the initial framing of the questions was uh, very much focused on historical you know, harms and um, damage. And um, as the questions evolved, they became, and you know, for us, we had drafted the questions in a balanced way, but I think the balance was not, um, you know, as explicit as some countries would have liked. So the questions did evolve a little to, you know, focus on the past, present, and future more explicitly. It um, some of the key components is in it is, you know, we. We realize the ICJ, you know, they're not scientists and they've said this many times, they don't want to weigh in too much on the science. They want to answer a legal question, but for us, like, you know, it's important that the science they use is uh, great science, the IPCC reports, you know, there's some acknowledgement uh, that anthropogenic, anthropogenic emissions, you know, is the cause of um, the climate crisis we're in. That's one of the components. The other that has become stronger, you know, within the General Assembly or within the the core group, was um, uh, human rights. You know, we had two of the core group members from the Right to a Clean and Healthy Environment uh, in our core group, and this was by design as well. And they imbued the resolution with a more human centric, you know, uh, feel and look. And now there's a you know standalone para that uh, invokes the Right to a Healthy Environment, and we're very pleased with how this has evolved. Uh, so uh, beyond that, uh, we all, you will notice in the chapeau, there's uh, quite a few uh, international laws cited. And I think for us, that's very essential. We don't want the court to focus primarily on UNFCCC, Paris Agreement to you know the exclusion of everything else. We see this as a very holistic issue. For the Pacific, climate change is a human rights issue. And we, you know, we want the court to answer the questions, you know, in light of the chapeau and the listing we've put there. Uh, but obviously we can't dictate to the court what it does, but that was, you know, a polite suggestion of where they look for uh, sources of law. And then in terms of the questions, um, so this question, the first question is something that was sort of imbued in our early iteration, but not made explicit. It asks about what the state obligations, and then the second one is the more climate justice question that you know talks about legal consequences of breaching uh, you know said obligations in the first question, and the two parts are interwoven. Uh, and uh, I, I I know there's yeah well maybe I won't comment on that here, but <laughs> uh, we we hope the court answers you know the full set of questions as robustly as possible. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, many people already know in this group uh, the questions, but if uh, maybe Jackie could copy paste them on the chat, that would be helpful just to have them at hand. Um, so moving on, I, I did want to note two, two features of the process and then the, the resolution that I think are worth uh, mentioning. One is the role of social movement, specifically the youth movement in bringing this up to the attention uh, very forcefully of states uh, in a campaign that I actually have not seen many parallels to. They persisted for many years. They had a clear vision, they stayed focused and they put pressure on the key levers uh, of power and ended up articulating an interesting alliance with state representatives. Uh, uh, for those of us who have tried to do something similar in the past, that's a very hard thing to do uh, because you either convince your peers in the social movement or maybe in academia, or you work with governments and then you end up kind of fully integrated into government structure. So this civil society state articulation from the global south is something that is quite remarkable. And in fact, one of the first webinars that CLX organized was uh, in late 2021 with Solomon Yeo, one of the student activists who's now a, a fellow at, at CLX, who explained 
the social movement movement aspect of it. And many people uh, in that uh, audience and in that conversation expressed some skepticism about the political uh, viability for getting this vote. So it's good to acknowledge when things go well, when a group of energized uh, activists and, and sympathetic and proactive state representatives get the job done in the midst of so many uh, examples that uh, would prove uh, the, that this is uh, hard or even impossible to do in other circumstances. And the second feature that Kevin already commented, also I won't say much about it, is the fact that given the origins of the uh, resolution proposal in the Global South, the framing of human rights is also quite clear in ways that it would not have been if the origin had uh, happened uh, somewhere else. So this bringing together of human rights and international law and climate science is something that I think is also quite promising for the international law regime on human rights and, and climate. So moving forward, uh, Kevin, I know that you're limited uh, in what you can say about the legal arguments and themes that you're hoping to cover and you hope allied states and partners uh, will also push uh, going forward. Uh, but could you say something about your expectations? Uh, what ideally you would like uh, both the ICJ and other states to be discussing going forward? Yeah, sure. Sorry, and I think I missed the, the last part of your question from before. Uh, just laying a bit of the context before I answer this one. So um, yeah. um, since the adoption, March uh, 29th, um, the, the UN Secretary General you know, is mandated to transmit the resolution to the ICJ. Uh, uh, and uh, this has just happened in the past week. So last week, um, the UN Secretary General, through the Office of Legal Affairs, had transmitted the letter with his letter indicating this is the will of the, the General Assembly. Uh, and then uh, earlier this week, the ICJ you know, had acknowledged to all member states that uh, you know, we've received this. You as a state party or as a member of the UN can make submissions. And then yesterday, a uh, press release came out, the public press release came out that indicated you know, we have received this officially, uh, letting the, the globe know that this has happened. What's next is uh, there's gonna be another order put out by the court that indicates uh, the time limits of submissions. So what, looking at past practice, uh, when the order comes out six months from that period, there'll be you know, the first round of uh, written submissions. Uh, after that will be a three month period generally for written replies and then a further order fixing the date of the oral proceeding. So you know, that's the lay of the land. We suspect that um, this is probably going to be one of those advisory opinions based on the conversations we've been having in New York with a lot of member states within our own core group as well, which is 18 countries, that there will be widespread you know, uh, submissions by a lot of member states. Uh, and we actively encourage that. I think it's a powerful signal to the court if many member states you know, indicate that this is their will and they want the questions answered. Um, so like to talk a little bit about maybe like some of the lawyers here might be interested in it. We've been inundated with requests. Well, we've been inundated by a lot of international lawyers you know, for support, pro bono, low bono. Uh, and we you know, are very much eager and interested in doing you know, like matchmaking with uh, a lot of the developing states that are coming to us who want to make submissions, but uh, who are limited by capacity and resource constraints. Um, a few judges have told us, you know, well, in in broader forums, uh, that it's important that there be coordination and cohesiveness with uh, the way submissions are done. You you don't want too many diverse opinions. You don't want too much of the same thing. So there's a fine line with you know giving the court um, something that's cohesive and something they can digest and you know respond to effectively from states. Uh, so going forward, like a part of like the role Venota plays as one of the proponents is to like help facilitate uh, state submission. Uh, when we've been talking quite a bit with Ambassador Kunjul from Mauritius, who was one of the most recent, you know, successful proponents of an advisory opinion. And in their case, there's a lot of coordination that happens. You know, obviously this is a different issue. It's not quite 
bilateral, you know, it's a, a very multilateral issue and we're all very eager to deal with the climate crisis. So I think, you know, there'll be a more, there'll be more of a sense. Maybe I'm a little naive, but I'm hoping there's more of a sense of community and, you know, a shared goal, which ensures that there is some commonality in the submissions we make, you know, the first point being, you know, the ICJ does have a mandate to, you know, answer this advisory opinion and then like flowing into the different themes. So that's maybe like where to answer your second question where, you know, we do want, I can't talk to the specifics of it, but, you know, some components we want fleshed out and uh, delved in a bit more, uh, you know, like we want the science to be clear. One of the most useful things I think that's happening right now is it loss. Uh, there's an advisory opinion pending before it loss uh, on climate change as well, but you know, it's limited to within the law of the sea domain, but we see it as valuable because one of the things it can do is, you know, make, um, and I think it loss is more, you know, able to do this way in more on the science, put out, you know, jurisprudence and an advisory opinion that is clear about that, that can then be, you know, uh, cited, invoked by the ICJ. Uh, similarly, like the human rights components, we think are very important. That's one of those common themes we've been talking about within the core group where we think we can have you know, common messaging. Um, and then, you know, this talks about like other, you know, we sort of move into this different space where we're talking about different advisory opinions, you know, beyond just that loss that uh, we think are very valuable. Uh, in terms of the ICJ, because it's all, you know, positive signal and going to the ICJ showing that uh, this is a growing movement. You know, we want these uh, areas of law clarified because of this, in this ambiguous space, this is where we're not meeting our obligations under the Paris Agreement or broader international law obligations. Thanks, Kevin. And we have two short final questions. So uh, for those of you, in the larger group, if you could start dropping your questions, typing your questions in the chat box, that would be great. So because as we promised, the rest of the um, webinar will be more interactive and will be basing the rest of the discussion on your questions going forward. So I wanted to pick up where you left off in terms of the relationship with other advisory opinions. One that is, of course, in many people's minds now is uh, the one pending before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights at the request of the governments of Colombia and Chile. It's a longer list of questions. Uh, it's also a very vibrant region in terms of civil society participation, legal expertise. The court itself in 2017 uh, handed down an important advisory opinion on the environmental issues. So the, the terrain is set for there to be a kind of high expectations uh, about that particular um, advisory opinion. How do you see that process relating to the ICJ advisory opinion? What, what can we expect from that interrelation, simultaneity of processes before two different courts, one regional and one uh, global? Yeah, I know that that's a great question. And the one like that we've been very excited about as well here in New York, like I've met several times with uh, the Colombian legal advisor, the Chilean legal advisor, when uh, there was a vice minister from Chile in town, we made a point of going to see her and talk about commonalities. You know, one of the values I think of the Inter-America Court of Human Rights is they allow amicus, you know, from NGOs. And, uh, you know, that's not quite the case with the ICJ. Uh, there has been, a, like you mentioned, a robust advisory opinion on the right to healthy environment. We see where that went, you know, and it's so valuable because it actively contributes to the development of international law. Uh, for us, you know, we think that like whatever advisory opinion comes out from the Inter-America Court of Human Rights, it's going to be uh, something that helps build a case for the human rights component of the question in the ICJ. We're also like keeping an eye on the judges that, you know, have links to the Inter-America Court of Human Rights because they're more readily open to, you know, uh analyzing and you know like um like looking at the advisory opinions that come from that jurisdiction you know uh we had met with uh one of the legal advisors from brazil and he happened to be judge trinidad's son and it was so interesting to hear about you know the appreciation for you know if judge consado was still with us and if he had heard this question it would have been something that he would have loved to have 
you know, answered and some probably delivered, delivered a like lovely, you know, like uh, advisory opinion on, or like maybe even a dissenting <laughs> opinion on that of great value. But um, people like him who did come from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, I think are useful. We currently have a judge on the bench that is from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So there are natural links already. And I think with uh, a couple of the ICJ candidates now, there, you know, we see strong human rights backgrounds, uh, hopefully a willingness to look at the jurisprudence of um, that court. Uh, so we're very excited by it. And we're talking actively with Colombia and Chile on how we can support and engage um, for many states out there. You know, there. if you look at the three the three questions put forward in this various fora, Inter-America Court of Human Rights, ETLOS, and, um, and the ICJ, there are commonalities. They're obviously distinct, but they are themes that, you know, weave them together. I would say they were all developed separately, but, you know, it goes to show that, you know, we all have the same uh, issues in mind and the same problems and maybe like ambiguity we're trying to like get to the heart of. So I, I think there's a common thread woven through all three, even though they had all developed uh, separately and, you know, in their respective silos. Vanuatu has joined COSIS, the Commission of Small Island States, uh, but this is sort of post facto after the questions were developed. Um, and yeah. I, I think as states make submissions, uh, they should actively think about uh, cohesion across the, those three advisory opinions because it just makes sense. Yeah, and I wanna highlight uh, what you said about coordination. If there is apprehension about a very fragmented approach to uh, submissions to the ICJ, one can also expect that there may be that risk in the process uh, before the uh, Inter-American Court of Human Rights, precisely because of the vibrancy of and the multiplicity of actors in the region. Uh, and I know that there are a number of efforts at trying to bring together uh, law-oriented NGOs, social movement organizations, uh, research centers, uh, in a way that will hopefully facilitate the uh, role of the court, which is no, which is not small because the, again, the questionnaire is long, the issue is complex. Um, so for those of you in the audience who are thinking of submitting amicus briefs before the Inter-American Court, this is a call for coordination and, and collaboration. So final question before we move to uh, questions from the participants in the larger group is uh, how, how do you, expect the court to address kind of the fact that there have been three different bodies of law uh, that have developed also relatively uh, um, independently from each other. So you mentioned earlier uh, the international climate law regime, there's international law per se, and there's then uh, human rights. So you're already proposing in the questions explicitly or implicitly that the court does can, that the court do kind of a, a rationalization, systematization uh, uh, exercise. You also said earlier that um, you were not as interested or necessarily the questions are not highlighting uh, the, or centering the IPCC uh, and the and the UNFCCC recommendations and approaches because those have gotten more attention that you'd rather see the court going and founding their opinions on uh, the on international law per se. So any anything that you can comment on the integration on the the prospects for integration and systematization that the court can might be able to deliver on in in their opinion. Sorry, just one clarification. We're not trying to, um, like, the IPCC is very essential for this question we've put forward. Uh, for what I said, it was more the climate regime, UNFCCC, Paris Agreement, you know, we don't want the court to just focus on that to the exclusion of everything else, but the IPCC plays a very essential role. The science, you know, that, you know, demonstrates the causal link, you know, between state conduct and the climate crisis we were facing is essential. So. IPCC is super important, and it's in the uh, it's in preamble uh, PP8 uh, uh, direct quote verbatim from the IPCC. And I know in uh, the eight loss advisory opinion, that's another component that's going to be fleshed out more. But just that clarity, clarity, I wanted to uh, raise. 
because for us that's super important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, more broadly, you know, sorry, go ahead, Cesar. No, go ahead, Kim. Um, well, one of the things is across the three different fora, it's essential that, you know, we don't want a fragmentation of international law. And I think there is, um, you know, the, the courts are very well aware of the different advisory opinions coming before, like, you know, it laws, um, Inter-America Court of Human Rights, ICJ, they're all very aware of what's happening, you know, alongside them. There's always constant communication. Uh, the registrar for the ICJ is from it laws, you know, so he has that common link. Um, and then you have judges from the Inter-America Court system as well in the ICJ. So we're, uh, we know there will be, you know, an effort not to undermine international law, whatever advisory opinion comes from different fora. In different meetings that have happened at the UN, you know, judges often come to the UN for International Law Week, et cetera. So uh, a few of these questions have been posed to them. And there's a considered effort not to undermine, you know, other institutions like with ICJ and it lost when it comes to uh, maritime disputes, you know, there are often a lot of harmonization and similarly, we expect the same here. Uh, to your point on um, the chapeau and the international law cited there, that's like where we think the meat of the question, you know, like rests because we're asking the court to do a lot of work actually, you know, like list obligations across this, you know, uh, varieties of rules, uh, principles, uh, customary international law. But we think at the end of the day, that's going to deliver something of value and move the needle forward. Because if we just rely on the Paris Agreement, the court will say, you know, states have an obligation to cooperate and, you know, that won't give us anything of substance. And we want the court to deliver something that will uh, allow us progress when it comes to addressing the climate crisis. So, that's one of the main reasons why there's a strong chapeau. Uh, and uh, we defended that chapeau quite extensively in uh, the negotiations of the resolution at the UN because, mm -hmm. you know, there was targeted efforts to take out things from there, add things that might not have added value. Uh, and it's relatively concise compared to the fourth preamble, which is like where the full listing of international law uh, is. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kevin. So let's turn to uh, questions from the audience. And the first question is from John Knox, who as a, a UN Rapporteur on the Environment and Human Rights did uh, a lot of the kind of groundwork in terms of bringing together uh, the human rights uh, and the climate regimes. So John is asking, how likely do you think it is that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights process will reach an opinion in time for the ICJ to take it into account? Um, hi, John. So my ambassador and I were actually there the day the right to a healthy environment was adopted, and we were very pleased to go up and celebrate with John the great work he and, uh, is it David? <laughs> David Boyd. Yeah. David Boyd, uh, celebrating the good work they did to lead, lead up to that point. And we also poached uh, a couple of the core group members from that core group, the Right to Health Environment. It's hard to say with the Inter-America Court of Human Rights. I've spoken to the, you know, like uh, the Colombian and Chilean lawyers and uh, what they were telling me was it's, you know, it's usually a quick turnaround. Uh, Cesar, you might be better placed to answer this. I know uh, that in terms of... Um, when there might be a hearing for this, it's likely uh, late in the first quarter next year, or you know even into the second quarter if someone asks us for an extension. So hopefully, uh, a couple of these advisory opinions come before. I know it lost. You know, there's a hearing uh, towards the end of this year, so uh, they're all moving very quickly. In our initial estimates, we had seen Inter-America Court of Human Rights first. Uh, it loss and then ICJ, but I think the timelines have shifted a little. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that timeline as well. Um, now, Jody Blackstock is asking a related question, but with regards to the two cases before the European Court of Human Rights, um, as you know, there was a, a, a hearing on one of them in uh, just a few weeks ago, and then the second one on the Portuguese uh, young people's uh, case is scheduled for September. Uh, so, but it's not clear, as Jody says, when there will be judgment uh, on, on these two cases. So, 
what is the realistic timetable for the ICG pro ICJ process is asking, uh, Jody is asking, uh, we, it's, is there anything that you can share in terms of at least the expectations for the timeline that we can take into account as many of the members of this community of practice work on the other cases? Yeah, no, I can guesstimate, uh, but based on our discussions with folks and like what we've been hearing uh, from folks, you know, around the court is the docket of the ICJ is quite packed this year. Advisory opinions take precedence, but uh, there is already, as you might know, another advisory opinion that uh, is ahead of us, the Palestine advisory opinion. And uh, we're anticipating a flood of submissions for the ICJ uh, advisory opinion on climate. And as a result, I think the court will require more time. Uh, past practice is indicated like one and a half years from start to finish. Uh, but it, in this case, I think it's a little different and there's going to be a lot of uh, content to sift through. So I, I suspect closer to two years, but uh, that's just an estimate. But in terms of the written proceedings, it's going to be uh, when the order comes out, like an estimate of six six months for the first round, three months for the second, and then I'm sure extensions for at least the first part by a month. Thanks for that uh, guesstimate, Kevin. Uh, we're at time, but so we were public sessions last somewhere between uh, 45 and 50 minutes. Uh, so if there's a Last minute questions, uh, last question, please uh, feel free to add it to the uh, chat. Uh, otherwise, I'll give uh, Kevin a chance to comment on any aspect uh, of this process that I may have missed in my questions or that the, the audience may have missed in the question. Anything else that you would like to highlight for a community of practice of, of lawyers and, and activists and scholars who are all interested in both what happens uh, at the SCJ uh, level and what happens uh, before the other tribunals and courts. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, maybe I'll talk, I'll pick up the point you raised on civil society and their role. Like it's uh, extremely important what they've done. You know, the inspiration for this initiative that Vanuatu has taken forward was the youth, uh, young law students in the Pacific bringing this forward. Like you mentioned, Solomon Yeo, one of the main proponents. Um, and I think, uh, you know, there's been so much effort put in by then. Obviously, you know, civil society, the government, different roles, but uh, with Inter-America Court of Human Rights, NGOs can make submissions for us within our core group. Just yesterday, uh, we were all talking about how do we, how do we like uplift the voices of the youth that have brought this initiative forward? Uh, you know, we're in large part doing a lot of the work because they have advocated so strongly for this. And uh, there, there are opportunities out there, but you know, one of them is, for example, you know, you can make an amicus, but it won't be in the record. Um, as a civil society, you can make, you know, a submission. Uh, it will be in the library for their perusal, and you know, past practice has indicated that you know, one judge, you know, in a dissenting opinion, did cite from a submission made by an NGO. But I think. Uh, just because there'll be a flood of submissions, I think we have to like try and find a way and an opportunity to ensure the voices, you know, of those that, you know, inspired this movement will, you know, be able to be heard. Um, so that's something we're contemplating and it'd be interesting maybe in the latest session to sort of get a sense of how we could possibly do this. Yeah, thanks for highlighting that, Kevin. It, it, it is important in processes and procedures that were designed for a different time, right? When when the civil society was not as active before the peak international courts, uh, they may be impervious to voices uh, uh, of uh, quite relevant actors like youth activists and even lawyers. Many of the people who pushed forward the initial proposal were the recent graduates from Pacific Islands uh, law schools, and, and uh, they continue to be quite active. And one of the beautiful things about this process is that uh, the process itself has shaped the careers and the and the and the trajectories of a number of young lawyers who are now active in various spaces. Uh, so we will continue to think about how this community practice and and the youth movement and youth lawyers can con continue uh, to contribute uh, to it. So 
with that, uh, Kevin, I wanted to uh, thank you again uh, for the um, for the for the time uh, for setting uh, aside some time to be with us. Uh, this is to be continued, of course. Uh, we look forward to following the developments uh, in the core group and then at the ICJ, and hopefully we can have a, a second round sometime during the process, maybe in a year's time or so when there's an interesting development, because of course we are all paying close attention to uh, this extraordinary uh, moment uh, in the ICJ uh, and at the ICJ and also in the climate uh, advocacy and lawyering. Uh, with that, uh, I, <laughs> people, as, as long as we said, uh, as, as soon as I said, we're closing people kind of felt a rush of inspiration. So do you still have uh, a few minutes, uh, Kevin, to take up a couple of questions? Uh, sure. Okay. So this is because this is more of a of an intimate space for people who come back often. We can do this. Uh, so Rashmi Raman is asking, uh, it's wonderful to see that Vanuatu has brought such an important question to the ICJ. It is certainly a vindication of the emerging voices in international law from the global south. What do you think other states in the global south should be doing to support the process? Oh, well, the first one is engaging in uh, the submission phase. Uh, we are moving our efforts, you know, from advocating for folks to, you know, like support the resolution and engage in the process to actually making written submissions. <clears throat> uh, Ambassador Kunjul, in a, like in one of the conversations we had recently, he said, you know, one important thing for them when they took the Chagos advisory opinion was you know make a submission even if it's one page long because what that allows you to do is it allows you access to everyone else's submissions as well as engaging in the second phase uh, of the written process. Uh, obviously, you can make you can appear before the court in the oral proceedings without having made a written submission. But I think you know uh, to effectively engage throughout the process, you need to be you know there from the very start making a submission. The other comment I wanted to make is. This is coming out from the Pacific. You know, we have quite a diverse legal team. We want to encourage uh, developing states that are making submissions to not just go with you know the London-based lawyers, the friend you know Paris-based lawyers, to try and engage their own um, attorney general officers, legal teams, you know, within capital to you know maybe alongside you know experienced counsel to make submissions because we want uh, to build up capacity over the years. You know, because. It's often the global south bringing for these types of initiatives because of the injustice they have through global systems, you know, the power dynamics, and this is a tool that we can use to, you know, bring equity to the way we we operate. So having more representation from the global south, not just in making the submissions, but engaging and participating through the, the process. Mm. That's a great place to end, Kevin. Thanks so much, and thanks to everyone uh, for attending today. We will have a final uh, webinar in a couple of weeks, a uh, final webinar of the semester, and then we'll go into a brief pause in terms of the series of events uh, that CLX uh, hosts, uh, and then we'll resume sometime in the northern summer. Uh, but uh, with that, I would invite those of you who registered for the private conversation uh, of the community of practice uh, members to switch to the other Zoom link. And for those of you uh, who were attending for the first time or are not part of that community practice, it, it's easy to become a part of it. You just have to email the person that, uh, who uh, is listed in the invitation in the announcement of this um, webinar. And we'll make sure to add you to that list. Thanks everyone. And see you on the other side for those of you who are staying on. Bye Kevin and thanks again.